welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways we can work together to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we have with us Matt Bracey and Chris Talbot. Both of them are about to be minted as PhDs. I think they're both what we call all but dissertation, and so uh, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. They're to the end of their particular programs, but they both have uh, long, extensive education, you both did your undergraduate degrees at Welch College, did you? And then we've got a JD degree down here on the end. So if you have any legal problems, always call uh, Professor Matt Bracey about that. And then we have uh, Chris Talbot here, who has lots of experience with youth pastoring. Is Both of them are at Sylvan Park and... Both of them are professors at Welch College in Gallatin, Tennessee. So thank you, too, for stopping by to be with us today. Yeah, thank you for having us. Now, the reason we've asked you to come by is because there's this nice volume out that you all have edited called Christians in Culture, Cultivating a Christian Worldview for All of Life. And I've just got to comment about this artwork. If you're able to watch, I encourage you to take a look at this. Wonderful artwork, and I think it also kind of uh, gets to the point of doing things well, doing things with excellence, talking about Christians and culture. But let's start out by just asking the question, what is it that led you all to put this book together, to edit this book? But also, I think both of you have written um, three chapters each and the introduction and the conclusion, so... You all have written quite a bit in this book, but what led you to do this book, Christians in Culture? Did you want me to go? Sure. So back in 2015 or so, we at Welch revised the general education curriculum to include a series of courses called Christianity, Culture, and Worldview. And there's been several teachers in the course, but what we've all discovered is that there's not quite, there wasn't quite a textbook out there accomplishing our desires for the course. And so over the course of several semesters, several years, we just came to the conclusion we need to write the textbook for this course because it doesn't exist. And so that's that's where the idea started. And from there we began working on, you know, what are the chapters? Who are the authors? What do these chapters look like? But that's where it started. That's great. And so I think you all have used like uh, crunchy cons and different texts like that, uh, trying to put a lot of different text together for this course, and as people will read this book, they'll see a lot of those works cited, so it's kind of a best of all worlds. You're able to get at those texts and also do it in in your own way. Yeah, well, I, I think we, we realize that a lot of our own resources, our own faculty members at the college were there, and so utilizing um, people that already taught these subjects and bringing them, them together to, to write this book. So let's kind of walk through that for a little bit. You've got Greg Fallbush. He writes about athletics. He and uh, Dr. Ketterman and uh, Greg uh, or um, Fallbush has been a coach for a long time, so he's coming at it from that perspective. I see Dr. Holly has a chapter in here, and uh, I think he's done a lot of work like that, something published in Integrity. Uh, President Pinson, of course, has some chapters, and uh, you've got uh, Matthew McAfee talking about science and so forth. I feel like we're leaving some people out that have uh, contributed as well. Who else contributed to the work? So Dr. Hawkins did the science chapter. Um, you mentioned Dr. McAfee. Mr. Thornsbury, Frank yes, Thornsbury, yes. has two chapters, one on literature and language, one on the public square, government, state, politics. Uh, Philip Morgan has uh, two chapters. He has one on tradition and history. He has one on economics, wealth, and poverty. Uh, You mentioned the two Gregs, uh, Greg Ketteman, Greg Fallbush. Is there anyone I'm missing? Hopefully not. (laughs) (laughs) We will hear about it later, but it is also interesting, like uh, Philip is pretty close to finishing his Ph.D. in history, and um, we've also got the MTSU English Ph.D., right, is uh, is, uh, Thorn... Thornberry close on that, I think. So a lot of folks are actively writing, actively researching that you've had contribute to this. So you've, you're using this as a textbook. It's available uh, through Welch College Press. It's also available through Amazon and wherever good books are bought. What are some other reasons that the general public could benefit from this particular book? 
Yeah, I think when we were writing it, we we at least had the intention or realized as we were writing through it two things. Um, one, I think what the book does well is it shows this really good harmony between different fields of knowledge. And so it demonstrates that what we believe theologically and biblically also fits with what we can believe when it comes to history and economics and science and all these other things. And so having these uh, these faculty members come together and showing how these these disciplines work together, I think, is um, is really helpful. And then we, we wrote it, too, with kind of the idea that the average layperson in the church could use it as well. I mean, we, we live in a confusing time to being a Christian about how, how do you live faithfully in the culture. And so we want to equip people, um, not just at our college, but in our churches as well, uh, to be able to live faithfully. So it's, it's written at the level of an 18-year-old, we hope, that, you know, can read. And so, yeah, lay people in the church, uh, small, group, uh, small groups, you know, reading options, things like that. But I mean, the, we got four chapters. There's, it's, so it's divided into two parts. There are four chapters in part one. It's foundations, and then chapters five through 15. It's all just practical stuff. So uh, to, your, to your point, it's very much about the integration of our faith uh, in, in the scriptures, in God, and, and his revelation in the scriptures, and their application, just of ordinary stuff. So we have stuff in there about music, and stuff in there about movies, and music, and labor, and vocation, you know, and, and science, and sports, just very practical stuff. So actually, it's the kind of thing a pastor might be able to take and use, like, perhaps with a midweek Bible study, trying to help their congregation think more biblically about labor, about, uh, I do think about the two Gregs, as you call them, you know, sports, and our uh, approach to sports, and so forth. Uh, even about tradition. I think President Pinson addresses that in one of his chapters. So a pastor could do that. It also looks like it's the kind of thing a parent could do. Is there? It looks like that's even part of what you had in mind when you wrote this book. Yeah. No, I'd love for parents uh, to maybe read through it with their teenagers, mm-hmm. um, especially as they're getting ready to go off for college. Um, I think it'd be a helpful thing to start giving them a little bit of a framework for how to how to think worldview like about the world. It's good. So let's start out with, uh, it's kind of broken down into the basis of a worldview where I think you talk about, Chris, how ideas matter. Tell us, uh, kind of break that out for us a little bit because they do matter. And that's kind of what we're running up against today, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, what, what I realized when I was teaching in the class, our Christian culture and worldview classes, especially the introduction, is that uh, to figure out like where we're at now, we really have to figure out like where we've come from. Mm-hmm. And so we have to figure out not necessarily what, what always Christians have thought, but I think that's very important, but also just what is the culture thought. And, uh, and so we're, we're sitting downstream from a lot of ideas and a lot of ideologies, a lot of different perspectives. And so uh, trying to map out like how did we get to the point that we're at now. And so I try to do a little bit of that. I mean, I mentioned a handful of uh, – uh, philosophers and philosophical ideas and things like that. But again, trying to do it in an accessible way and talk about how do we move kind of through modernism into this kind of postmodern relativistic age that we find ourselves in now. So if someone takes that chapter and they read it, they're one, they're going to have a sense of history. You know, you talk about the Enlightenment and you talk about um, modernism and postmodernism. So it's it, we, it, we didn't just get here overnight. So we can kind of take that, trace that, see how uh, different ideologies influenced us to this point. So they're getting an education, but they're also seeing how one thing tends to lend, tends to lead to something else, That's doesn't right. it? Yeah. That's good. And in that same section, um, uh, Professor Matt, you talk about classical conservatism, right? And so uh, we think a lot about Christians sometimes being conservative, but you, you kind of break it down as to what liberalism is, what conservatism is, and what a good conservative might look like. So kind of break that out for us as well. So often we distinguish, but often we think of conservatism and liberalism and progressivism in terms of politics. Um, but part of what I argue in that chapter is that it's much more basic than that. It's, it's more of a, a way that we think about life. It's a lens through which we think about life. And so in that chapter, I've got 10 principles of, of the conservative and, uh, and part of what I'm arguing is that as Christians, we are conservatives insofar as we are trying to conserve that which is good and true and beautiful that's been handed down to us. So, you know, uh, 
Jesus taught the apostles and the apostles taught, you know, their who they taught and and so on and so forth and so you have you know injunctions in the new testament about uh, you know the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints and so on and so forth to mr talbot's point we don't just live in a vacuum the ideas that we have they didn't just come out of nowhere and the same is true with truth i mean we have um truth revealed in the scriptures but then there's also the way in which it's been interpreted through the course of of, of human history and through through the course of Christian history. So, for example, uh, one principle of the conservative is belief in a transcendent moral order. So the conservative believes in God. The conservative believes in morality. Another principle of conservatism is that it's good to listen to those who have preceded us. You know, it's good to honor our fathers and mothers. That's one of the commandments, by the way, you know, honor your father and mother. It's good to learn wisdom from from those who have come before us. Another principle is that... Um, man in this life is not perfectible. So systems that, are, that, that assume the inherent goodness of man are to be, were to be suspect of those systems. So stuff like that. It, it's, so it's, it, it concerns the way that we think about art and concerns the way that we think about politics and concerns the way we think about just all kinds of things. Good. So you all use those chapters, and there's chapters of others as well, to kind of lay the foundation and then you move into application. And so there's where we get into some really exciting things. That's where the, the, um, this part about sports is at and, uh, and, and other aspects. But talk to us a little bit, um, Professor Bracey, about arts and entertainment. Uh, that's kind of like one of your favorite subjects anyway, isn't it? I do enjoy the arts. Um, so chapter 7 is it's the arts and entertainment, you know, that which consumes our lives, it seems, as Christians, sports and the arts consume our lives in a huge way. Everybody is always watching games, watching movies, watching TV programs. So what I wanted to do was, how do we look at this and think about this Christianly? And Because part of what I've noticed when I talk to people, you've got some people whose idea is, well, we don't really need to pay attention to that stuff at all. They, they take what you might call a withdrawal approach. And then you have others who just, it's all in. They'll pretty much watch anything and enjoy it on some level, and you think to yourself, well, maybe that's a bit too much. So how do we think about these things as Christians? So in that chapter, I talk about how we can think about the arts. And when I say the arts, I mean the arts broadly. Mm -hmm. So we're talking music, we're talking movies, we're talking television, we're talking clothing, just all this kind of stuff. But um, how should we think about the arts theologically in, in light of doctrines like creation, the fall, redemption, the church? Um, I then get into a section on the, the thinking about the form versus the content, and, and we analyze these things a little bit differently. For example, a movie, hypothetically, might have a really good message. Its content might be really good, but it might be done in a really poor way. Yeah. Or you might have a movie that's done really, really well, but its message is horrible. And so how do we think about these different things? And then I have a section on just ways to approach this subject practically. How do we approach this subject practically? Do, do, is the answer withdraw, or is the answer, answer engage? And if we engage, well, how far is too far? How do we do it? What, what sorts of limits do we draw for ourselves, if any at all? So you, we all have probably watched the Babylon Bee or look at the Babylon Bee from time to time, and you're kind of alluding to how they make fun of some Christian movies. They all have the same theme and so forth. So I've, I'm sensing you're talking about we need to do things with excellence and, uh, and then thinking about how, how art and entertainment influence us as well. And so uh, you mentioned Dr. Holly earlier. He, he talks a lot about that in his chapter. Uh, what he does is he takes the principles of Philippians 4.8, Think on whatsoever things are true, good, beautiful, of good repute, if there's any excellence, these kinds of things. And so if that's the, and then he looks at what's the application of that to thinking about the arts. And so then, then the question becomes, are we to think and dwell on things that don't have excellence? They might have excellence in their content, but what if their form is really, really, really poor? Yeah, that's good. So we're looking for both, we're, and we're critiquing everything that we look at and listen to. So Professor Talbot, you get into some interesting stuff talking about technology. You've got um, a whole chapter where you talk about uh, technology and innovation. So maybe break that down a bit for us. Sure. Um, 
I, I, especially doing youth ministry for quite some time, I've, I've thought quite a bit about technology and especially digital media and how that affects uh, teenagers, but then also people more broadly. And, um, you know, we, we find ourselves using this technology, but in some ways we find that the technology kind of uses us or, or forms us in pretty significant ways. Um, I start off the chapter by trying to define exactly what we're talking about when we're discussing technology. We tend to think of like computers and iPhones or microphones or things like that, but really a technology is anything that like is is something that we've made that we've tried to improve upon. And so in its own way, like a hymn book is is a kind of technology because it appro- improves on something that uh, that came before it. Um, but I, I get further into like how, how is this relationship between culture and the technologies that it uses? How do Christians, how should they think about different technologies? So um, should we just kind of have this uh, full-on embrace or should we have suspicion or is it some balance in between? Now, I think a lot of times with technology specifically, we're either very anxious about it. Um, you know, I think about current conversations with like AI um, or things like that and we get really anxious or we just kind of buy all in on it and we, we don't think twice about it. And so I'm trying to chart a little bit of a middle way where we, where we say – Technologies can be both a blessing and a burden, um, but we need to take kind of each one and think critically about it and think thoughtfully about it. Not just jump on the uh, the train of progress, uh, but also not hit the brakes too quick either. Um, and then at the end of the chapter, I try to bring in kind of a view of eschatology at the end. So if we think in uh, the book of Revelation uh, that you have the new heavens and the new earth and you have a city that comes down, the new Jerusalem, it's really kind of the product of, of culture. I mean, you have walls and you have these depictions of things made with human hands, although it's been purified, right? God, uh, Christ has made all things new. Um, if, if that's true, and that's kind of technologies, broadly speaking, how does that inform what we're doing now if we see kind of a technology use in the future? And should how, how, that sh- how should that craft our, our current task and our current involvement in, in culture? I think in this chapter you talked also about like technology and social media yeah, yeah. and um, how, if my memory is correct, some particular platforms are actually, uh, they're tied more, make more susceptible to particular sins. Do you remember that? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I forget exactly what they were, but like, essentially each social media corresponds with like one of the seven deadly yes, sins. Yeah, like pride. And, yeah. Um, but but anyway, you talked about, uh, I think, LinkedIn mm-hmm. maybe was pride, and yeah. or maybe that was Facebook. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I think Twitter oh, was anger. It was <laughs> anger. And so we've got that, and yeah. I forget what Instagram was. But yeah. Yeah. but really, that's a good way to think about mm-hmm. you know what we're susceptible to uh, based on various forms of technology. Yeah, yeah. It's good. And then you wrote a chapter on labor, uh, uh, Professor Bracey, you want to break that down for us a bit. Labor and vocation. So if you're teaching, and whether in the context of the church or the classroom at a college or the church, you're dealing with all kinds of people who have all kinds of jobs. Or if you're dealing with students, you're, you're dealing with people, some of whom want to be pastors, some of whom want to be youth pastors, some of whom want to be counselors, accountants, whatever the case may be. Um, sometimes people who aren't pursuing the ministry, quote-unquote, feel as though maybe their job isn't as important. And so part of what I'm trying to do in that chapter is to um, invest non-church jobs with divine significance. Um, so in this chapter, I, I look you know, carefully, critically at what the Bible says about uh, vocations, about jobs, uh, both both in the church and the temple, but also just regular ordinary people, tax collectors, fishermen, uh, these kinds of folks. I also say, so, so I make this distinction and, and look at how we can look at these more equally, um, but I also have a section where I talk about how vocation, it's broader than just our jobs. It's, it's vocation means what God has called you to, or as, it means calling. So as Christians, we believe our vocations are those things God has called us to. So it's also about our family. It's also about our churches. It's also about our community. Um, But but to see our path, our paths in life as things that God has called us to. It's called us to things to do. Uh, So it's much broader sometimes than we, and most of it's not paid. You know, you think about family, you think about church, you think about, you know, the way that you uh, witness to your community or serve your community. But as far as our paid vocations are concerned, um, I, I talk about uh, 
should we think about that as our ministry? Like, if you don't work in the church, but say you work in a business office, should you think about that as your ministry? And the answer is yes. You should think of that as your ministry. I talk about um, sacred versus secular. Sometimes people make that division, and I suggest maybe there's a better way to think about it than sacred versus secular, because that makes it sound like the people who aren't doing church jobs aren't doing sacred jobs. But sacred is just a word that means holy or set apart. And if this is the thing God has called you to, then he set it apart for you, for your calling. So, um, you know, I'll work through some of those kinds of things. On the one hand, uh, you know, a job is a place where we serve our neighbors. On the other hand, a job is a place where we make money so that we can serve our neighbors. On yet another hand, a job is a place where we contribute to human flourishing and make the world a better place. It's certainly a place where we also witness so there's just all kinds of things like that that I'm getting into in that chapter. So if I'm a pastor and I'm trying to use this particular book, I can try to help my congregation understand whatever work you're doing, it matters. That's right. Uh, it's important. It's important to the kingdom. It's important to do it well and with excellence. If I'm a parent and I'm working with uh, my, my child, I can say, yeah, you could be a computer scientist, you could be a pastor, but all of it matters and is important. And Going back to the technology chapter, thinking about how technology shapes us, whether we be a young person or whether we be an older person, sometimes we're more susceptible to those things. So, well, you all have done a, you've done a good job. We, sh- we need to remind our listeners that they're really, it looks like, a good portion of, of the faculty. We've got science, we've got athletics, we've got history. Uh, we've got a lot of different subjects that are in this particular book. And is it, are they take this class, their freshman or sophomore year, the students? So we have three uh, Christianity, culture, and worldview classes, but they read this in the first one. Okay. Yeah, in the introduction class. So that's why you say it's written at a 18, 18-year-old really could do that. So you're thinking about teenagers, you're thinking, you know, really about any adults. And so I guess kind of we'll close it up by saying, what do you hope for this book as, uh, as it moves forward and goes out into the public? Yeah, I think our end hope or our end goal with writing this book is just to encourage Christians in general, um, more specifically our students that we wrote the book for, um, to just think more Christianly about life, uh, to realize that when they uh, walk out of church on Sunday morning, they don't have to check their faith at the door, but as they go into their jobs, when they think about technology, history, sports, science, whatever it is, uh, that they bring the Lordship of Christ even into those, those areas. Um, and so it as they're transforming their mind, as Romans 12 tells us, uh, they, they apply it to every square inch of, of, of culture. The sovereignty of God follows us wherever we go, you know, whether we're scrolling on our phones, uh, whether we're at our jobs, whether we're watching a movie, playing sports, playing games, it follows us everywhere. And so bringing that to bear and Christian truth to bear on everything that we do is really, really important for us as, as kingdom citizens. That's good. Well, I applaud you for taking the time to write and edit this particular book. I think it's something that can be helpful to our our listeners and our watchers, if you will. And I hope that people will take this particular work and put it into practice because I know it was a sacrifice when you were trying to do your dissertations and all of that to get this done at the same time. So thank you for putting this together for us. Thank you for having us on. Thank you. And we want to thank you for taking the time to listen today. We want to encourage you, if you know someone that would benefit from this podcast, please take it and share it with them. We know that every little thing we do really matters, and we truly are better when we work together. Thank you for joining us today.